Looking to earn PDH credits for watching this webinar? Please log in to SFP's eLearning platform and select this webinar. Earning PDH credits for this webinar on this platform are free for SFP members, but non-members will be charged. If you're just looking to listen or share information on fire protection engineering, feel free to continue with videos here. So uh, today I'm going to give uh, the seminar, which is titled uh, Challenges of Today and Tomorrow in Fire Science and Engineering. And it's actually a longer version of the talk, the half an hour talk that I gave, 20 minutes talk that I gave last week in Nashville, at the expo and conference of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. I was very honored, I was honored and humbled uh, by receiving the fantastic award of the Guys Medal. Um, and I chose this topic, but the presentation in Nashville um, was more compact, there was less time available. So today I'm, I'm giving you uh, a wider, uh, broader version of it. Um, so the, what I want to cover as a topic is uh, fire protection engineering is changing, it's changing significantly, and, and the pace of change is gathering. Uh, this is something that most professionals would agree with. Um, so I just want to give an overview of why it is changing in the sense of uh, taking a look at what are the drivers for the change and, and what are these drivers changing in sense of what, we, what is the system, the fire protection systems that are being changed. Um, bear in mind while I go through this that um, this is, I'm, I'm an academic, okay, um, I'm a scientist uh, with a role of producing knowledge in, in fire science. I'm also an engineer um, by background, all my degrees are in engineering, and actually I am a professor in an engineering department. So I, I, I look into the two things. I look into uh, how to produce knowledge, how to educate the new generations, but I never forget um, that we are aiming at the engineering side of fire protection and, and how to enable safer protection of our citizens. Bear, bear that in mind because it's a specific point of view. If an engineer without background in science were to do the same talk, Obviously, you should expect something different, um, but hopefully um, you, you can see the benefits of, of me going over this. The method that I use is, is not just my, my own opinion on this. Obviously, when I was asked to look into this topic, it was the NFPA actually who asked me to look into the topic of challenges and trends in fire safety engineering. I was very happy because I thought they were asking for my specific opinion. And you know, academics, we have a lot of opinions. But then I realized, I, I pondered about this, and I thought, no, Guillermo, I don't think they're after your opinion alone. I think they're asking you, Guillermo, to reach out to the network that I have um, as editor-in-chief of Fire Technology, as a person that has been around and traveling quite a bit in this field for the last 20 years. I've, I've, I have a network of people that I know. So I think NFPA and the Society of Fire Protection Engineers were asking me to reach out to my expert friends and colleagues and ask them, for their views of what's changing in fire protection engineering and provide here an overview of, of what I gather from their views. So this is what I did. Um, in particular, the, the means by which I asked my network was by reaching out to the journal. So I'm the editor-in-chief of Fire Technology. This is the oldest um, continuously publishing journal of fire science in, in, in the world. It was funded in 1965, it's been publishing since then, it's currently in really good health. Uh, we are, um, objectively speaking, very influential. We're probably the most influential journal in the field of fire. There are seven journals in our field. Uh, we are one of the, um, ac academically speaking, or in terms of citations, we're one of the uh, most cited, or if not uh, the most cited. Uh, we have a uh, large number of submissions. We attract about 300 submissions per year and only between 30 and 40% of these are considered to, to be to, this, to the level of, of, of quality and interest that actually get accepted. So we, we publish about 100 journals, uh, 100 papers per year. Um, so it's a very, it's a peer review journal, it's, it's multidisciplinar, and it has an emphasis on, we publish research, uh, but we publish the research that is looking towards the engineering application of fire protection engineering. So we, we, we don't forget that at the end, the knowledge that we produce is to help engineers uh, do their, their, world, their, their work and, and, and keep a world safer. Um, so it's, it's um, applied science in that sense. So I asked the board, 
about their views. The board of fire protection engineering of, of, of uh, fire technology is um, is about 50 professionals. Uh, the time that I did this about three years ago, I was transitioning between two boards. The, I was renewing the board, it's something that is good to do every few years. So I was actually, I was in the opportunity of asking about 80 professionals um, uh, about this. Many of you uh, in the audience would know um, the members in the board. If you go online, you can take a look uh, the website of the journal, who is in the board, who are our associate editors, and who are the members at large of the board. Uh, there are many, many uh, well-known names of the society of NFPA in the US, in Europe, in Asia, pretty much all over the world. Um, um, so I, I went through them and I asked them, um, what are their views about fire protection engineering? Why is it changing and what is changing? And I asked 82, 81 people and 72 reply, which is fascinating. It's a super high level of participation. Um, actually, if you think about this, it's, 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 it shows that actually the people were really wanted to contribute to this study. It was not that they were like, oh my God, another survey. They were actually, they, they themselves launched into a survey uh, and, and complete, um, it was a short survey. That helps, right? When I look into the people that I invited, these 81 people, which is mostly the 72 that reply, is about 50 were in industry, about 50 were in academia. So there's a good balance there into the research uh, that looks into the engineering side. So it's not fundamental research for the sake of doing research. It's actually research that is tailored toward producing innovation and helping improve technology. Uh, the age of the board is uh, about 40 years old, which means that we had so many uh, experts that have been around for a long time and have accumulated a lot of wisdom and expertise, but also we have uh, people who have um, fresh ideas and are coming from new generations. So we, we had a balance across um, uh, ages. And also about sectors. Uh, the board is very heterogeneous. Every single one of the layers of our protection, even the forest and the pollution side and the toxicity, but of course the prevention and the flammability and the detection and the suppression and the evacuation and the structural response, all the sectors are represented because they're represented in the journal. Therefore, they are represented in, in the survey as well. So we are not, um, we, we were I'm aiming not to have a specific view on, on minority sectors, but uh, broad sectors. So the first thing when you do a survey uh, is you try to avoid as much as possible what is called the free text uh, reply, where is where you tell people to give you their own text reply. Because if you do that, every, then you start having the problem with synonyms. And uh, different countries might have different words, technical words for meaning the same thing. So you need a level of consistency for this. Otherwise, um, there's a lot of mix. So the way I approach to this is I, I first, before actually asking them for what's changing and, and, and why, I, tell them, I told them, tell me uh, the number, tell me the top three drivers uh, that you have ever seen uh, that are interesting to fire protection engineering. And, and then I, I, I cleaned the list. I got uh, many of them. I, can, I, I got like 40 of them. And I cleaned them. I, I removed synonyms. I simplify when one was a problem of the other. I simplify the list. And I came out with this list of 15 topics, which initially was in alphabetic order. But then Fred Moller pointed out that this list is actually not alphabetical. It's only halfway alphabetical. But anyway, those are the 15 topics uh, high, uh, in order of no particular interest. So it doesn't mean anything. You could see all of them are important topics in fire protection engineering. We're talking about aging population, a better understanding of fire, which is fire science, climate change, developing economies, economic losses, education, energy efficiency, energy infrastructure, sustainability, the role of the fire service, growing population, insurance companies, interface between science and technology, novel building architecture, and performance space. Okay, all of them, by definition of how I came up with it, are important topics in the field. Uh, the question is, which ones are the most important ones and to quantify the importance of, this, of, of, of these topics. And that's what I did uh, in, the, in the second part of the study. So I launched this question, it read, it, it reached all these 81 people. I said, please reply according to your own expertise, uh, not by what other people say, but by what you as an expert has been selected for the survey as according to what you see, uh, and assign a percentage of importance to each of the drivers. Uh, and at the end, what they selected as important, they sum up 100 uh, points. So we are looking into the percentage of importance, right? So if someone gives um, a topic 50% importance, then it means that, no, that, that, that is, is, is definitely one of the most important ones uh, with a 50% weight of it. 
And first was I was asking for the top drivers of change in fire protection engineering, which means is why things are changing. And the second one following up was, and what is changing? Because uh, I realized very quickly doing the list of topics that if you look into the drivers, that doesn't tell you the systems. And if you look into the systems, it doesn't tell you the drivers. So it's, it's actually the two uh, part of it. Um, and these are the results. So I'm ordering them from low to high. So I start from the bottom of the table. Um, this is expressing percentage of all combined together of, of importance. The index of importance is the percentage. The higher that number, the higher the importance uh, respect to uh, all the others. And this I'm up 100. So important, but of low importance in the context of the survey, but we saw it was growing population, energy, critical infrastructure, and climate change. They were at the bottom of it. Then in the next tier, which I call medium low importance, it was aging population, energy efficiency, and the growth of safety culture in developing economies, and also a better understanding of fire. Of course, you can imagine that as a, science, a fire scientist whose life is to actually create, create new knowledge, uh, in, in fire science, I was, I was sad to see that a better understanding of fire was not higher up in the list. But that's what happens when instead of giving your own particular opinion, you actually reach out to your network. Uh, that the, the, your own opinion is put into the context of what a much larger group of smart people are, are seeing. And then in the second tier from, of importance, what I call the medium high importance, then it was economic losses, Far fighting and the far service and insurance companies. Um, I particularly happen to think that insurance companies have a very important role in this field and they actually can play. There is a lot of room for them to play an even imp more important role uh, in, in, in fire safety engineering. So I, I was happy to see that it was considered one of the most important topics. And at the very top, we have uh, the topics that I rank as. Well, I didn't rank them. I, I call them high, high importance, but they were ranked themselves as uh, as high importance. Um, and these are um, education in fire protection engineering, uh, which is obviously really good news for me as an academic. I'm involved uh, about 30% of my time. One third of my time is to educate the new generations of engineers. So it's really good to see that there was an emphasis on education and the importance of education as a driver for change in fire protection engineering because education is the future of the field. If, if, the, if the field thinks that the education is changing the field, that means we have a really good future in fire protection engineering. Um, then uh, just above that with a 9% of importance, it was novel building architecture, novel building architecture in terms of materials or shapes or systems are bringing. So which means new engineers are being asked to design for new things that they haven't seen before. Uh, and, and the architecture is already hinting that it's actually mandated by the architects. So it's the architects who are asking the engineers to do new things. And this is a driver of change. We, in fire protection engineering, we are doing different things, uh, and nine percent of it because we are asked to be doing different things. Then just above novel building architecture is the interface between science and technology. This is also called innovation, which is the fact that knowledge per se is useless if it doesn't link into technology and engineering. The art of applying this knowledge uh, is, is innovation, which is no guarantee, but it's very powerful uh, if it goes well. And I was really happy to see that as the third more important one, uh, how to create new technologies and innovate to interface with science. And then uh, number two, with a 10% of importance, environmental protection and sustainability. The two of them uh, is a very modern topic, uh, not only in fire protection engineering, but every single engineering branch um, in the world is actually um, being asked to look into sustainability and environmental protection and fire protection engineering is not different in that sense. And at the very top, um, with a 12% of importance, is the single most important driver of change in the field is performance-based design. Um, so these are the drivers of our causing change. And then the next question I'm going to present now is, but what are they changing? Uh, so these are the top, yeah. So this is what they are changing. Um, you can see I start again from the bottom, going upwards. You can see uh, starting from the bottom is biomass fuels, cloud computing, wind turbines, hydrogen vehicles, 
photoelectric solar panels, fiber composite polymers, old versus uh, new furniture and items of ignition, flame redundancy, forest fires, which is a big topic now, and even uh, more detailed or high fidelity experiments for the state of the art model. Uh, these were important topics that are being changed or important systems for fire protection engineering that are being changed, but, um, but the top ones uh, are even more important actually were, uh, according to the group that was surveyed, to consider the top uh, most important systems, which are smart firefighting. I will go a little bit slower over these uh, topics later on. I can tell you more about uh, what each of these systems are. Then panels, then batteries for energy storage, then building facades, then timber buildings, and at the top, with a 50% importance, the single most important system being affected. Um, in fire protection engineering is the design and the architecture of the new buildings. It has obviously strong relationships with one of the one of the drivers that we mentioned in the other part of the survey, which is the, the fact that we have new new buildings. So now um, I'm going to go over the top drivers, and then I will go over the top systems, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish with um, uh, with a conclusion. So. <clears throat> We, we, we saw that the group of experts considered the number one driver for change to be the performance-based design. Uh, by this, we mean uh, this game changer that is uh, appearing in the desk of the engineers, where instead of having to follow um, a set of prescribed steps uh, and then assume that if they follow the steps, that therefore the building will be safe, which is assuming that it's safe, actually the engineer has to demonstrate that is safe. And instead of um, a recipe for how to design, the recipe is how to um, how to reach, uh, how to, uh, sorry, the goals themselves. So what you prescribe is the safety goals. Uh, you don't prescribe the design method. That has to be demonstrated. Uh, this has big connotations in all engineering fields because that is truly what an engineer does. An engineer is most or is best as an engineer when it actually doesn't have to follow a set of recipes, where it's actually allowed to think, especially as a team, uh, is where new ideas and innovation uh, can happen. And it's actually a global movement. Uh, it's true that it's taking a really long time. It was started, I think it is in New Zealand in the, in the 80s or maybe in the 70s. It was predicted to take over the world really fast and it's not. It's taking over the world, but very slowly. It is impossible to stop. It's a trend that doesn't allow to go back. It's an irreversible change. Uh, but even now, the US has very serious conversations about how to move this into the future. Um, here in the UK, um, it's something that um, engineers can choose how to design one way or the other. So there is all this uh, flexibility. And other countries, you only can uh, design by, um, by performance based. Um, this new way of, of designing, which doesn't assume um, that the steps will lead you to safety, but they actually you have to demonstrate the safety, is built on the massive collective wisdom that we engineers have, have, have created over the generations, which is in prescriptive code. So it's not that performance-based design throws prescriptive code uh, through the bin, through the bin, not at all. It actually is built on top of it. It's actually the foundation of, of performance-based design is uh, the, the knowledge that we have uh, produced in prescriptive uh, codes. Um, in terms of a positive outcome, I mean, there are many positive, but the one that I would like to highlight is that this creates an even stronger need for more well-prepared fire protection engineers. If there was already a need for more fire protection engineers. Uh, the change, the, the move towards performance means that we, know we need even more, uh, which obviously is, is really good because it means the field will grow. It means that there's a stronger uh, link with um, universities that are producing the engineers and the next generations um, and creates this partnership between industry and, and science. Of course, not everything is uh, beautiful. Uh, there is also negative impacts or issues that need to be resolved. There are many, but I would like to highlight one that has, has been mentioned to me very often when we talk about performance-based design, which is the lack of consistency. For example, in particular, uh, the engineers, when they are designing for performance-based design, together with authorities, they have to decide which are going to be a design fires that are going to challenge their, their system to see if the system can actually endure safely the, the, the fire. And 10 engineer teams typically will produce 10 different design fires. So there is lack of consistency at the really beginning 
of the process. Uh, this could be could be improved, uh, and is something that a lot of people are looking into. This. Um, at this point, I would like to bring the words of Professor uh, Branigan from Maryland. Um, when we talk about codes uh, and the difference between be, between performance-based design and prescriptive uh, design, Professor Branigan, who had a degree in law and a broad expertise in fire protection engineering, he said, "A Titanic comply with all codes. Lawyers can make any device legal; only engineers can make them safe." So, from for, for me, Professor Branigan is calling to say engineers are best at doing fire performance based design, whereas maybe uh, legal teams uh, uh, should worry more about um, the prescriptive uh, design. But obviously, that's an ideal situation. It's time for engineering on Earth to move to that ideal situation where um, performance-based design um, rules. Second driver, which is uh, in the mind of many engineers, um, so the survey in that sense was um, confirming what everybody thought is that this modern ethos of environmental protection and sustainability is everywhere even in fire protection engineering by sustainability is a it's a not it's not a technical word and it's been used a lot and very quickly which means actually it's very difficult to know what it means it means so many different things at the same time so making a survey about this and trying to be short about it i thought that the best definition was that sustainability is um the process by which we eliminate or try to eliminate the negative environmental impacts of the system that we are dealing with. And by environment, we don't mean just the forest uh, or, or the atmosphere. We mean everything around the system that is not the system itself. And that includes space and time. So it's not just the surrounding buildings or the surrounding underground waters. We're actually talking about what would happen in 10 years or in 100 years. Uh, or when the next generation inherited that system. And it's, it's, it has to consider the life cycle of the system. And we are looking into social, economical, and ecological consequences of what we are doing. Uh, energy, waste, carbon footprint, all these are, are big keywords. Uh, something positive is that by embracing it, fire protection engineers are becoming more modern because citizenships around the world are asking us to take a look at this. They're not asking us to come up with completely different solutions that would only do sustainability. They're saying, please keep doing fire safety. You are really good at this, but also please just look into the environment, look into the sustainability in space and time around the system. Don't forget that the system doesn't exist in, in the vacuum, that it has actually things around it and people around it. Um, and it's good to, to embrace something that society will consider to be a modern. that are leading to fast changes, too fast changes in fire protection is that sustainability and the particular, the, um, the form that it takes in green buildings are bringing into, the system, into our buildings uh, materials and systems that we still don't understand from the point of view of fire. And many of them, we actually have concerns that they are too flammable or more flammable than what we would like them to be. And this involves something that I'm going to discuss later on, like batteries or facades or solar panels, or actually modern um, pressures to downgrade uh, flammability requirements, like what is happening in California with the TB117, when for the first time, I think, in history, uh, a leading country in fire protection actually has decided that prevention is not an important layer of protection. And apparently, they're asking just to focus on, on detection and, and evacuation and suppression instead of uh, the, 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 the keystone of, of prevention, which is to begin with, try to avoid the fires um, from harming anyone. Um, so positive things and negative things, even in, in protecting the environment. The third one that um, was highlighted as a driver is the interface between science and technology. This is something that happens not in the university and not in the companies, the industry companies. It happens between the two of them. So whenever, for example, this webinar itself, a lot of the audience, I'm sure, are engineers who are designing. Um, I, I'm, I'm not I'm an engineer, but I don't design. Um, just in, in this seminar, in the wires there of the internet is where the interface, in a way, is, is happening. So knowledge per se is not useful to engineering in particular. It's not useful to anyone. It could be fun. It could be challenging, but it's not useful. But when this new knowledge, this research, the outcome of the research is combined with previous knowledge, and apply 
in a new form, in a new system, in a new sol solution, and it creates a new technology or, or a new way of solving a, 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 an actual problem, then magic happens and then innovation happens and then actually humanity is moving forward uh, with, with better things um, uh, and providing more uh, safety or the same safety as before, but actually complying with, uh, with other better outcomes in performance of, of weight or sustainability or, or comfort or, or cost, etc. Um, positive things is that um, this means that by enforcing the interface between science and technology, we are creating a venue that will produce ideas for tomorrow. Uh, the ideas will not be today, although the knowledge is being created today. The interface requires some some latent time and some patience and some working, and the meetings have to happen at uh, the beginning. The meetings between science and technology um, are not straightforward because they're using different nomenclatures. They mean different things. They have different time responses. In industry, things have to be done by tomorrow, sorry, by yesterday, and things in, in, in science have to be done uh, by next year. Um, anyway, when in the meetings, when this interface is developed and is understood and is, is protected and, and fostered, then new tools, new theories, new models, new systems, new paradigms, new defined concepts, new design concepts, all, all, all of the above happens. Um, just think that um, anything that you do as an engineer today, anything that could be considered engineering knowledge, uh, at some point it was created by someone uh, uh, that probably was uh, struggling at the beginning to communicate. And then at some point someone listened to this person with this new knowledge, and then this new knowledge now is in textbooks and is being used by you and by many engineers in the world. So let's not assume that the, the textbooks are, are, are landed from, from, uh, from the sky on us. Actually, there are human endeavors. Um, it means that at some point we didn't know these things and, and the creation of knowing it and passing it such that the engineers start to apply is it takes time uh, and it will not be quick and it will not be easy. And within the context of not being quick or easy, yes, there are negative parts of the interface. The interface is slow, is relatively painful, and it's not guaranteed that actually would lead to innovation because innovation is not guaranteed. Innovation is something that you try, not something that obviously will happen. Um, so it's, it's a high risk, high gain kind of game in the sense that if you actually invest the time and the energies in, in the interface, the, the possible outcomes are, are game changers and, and actually will benefit not just uh, a specific company or a specific sector, but actually can benefit uh, many, many people. Um, and uh, this is, in a way, um, I think, well captured by a quote by, uh, by Goethe, where in German, but translated to English, he said that knowing is not enough, we must apply, and willing is not enough, we must do. Uh, I think these uh, three sentences, well, sorry, four, four fractions of a sentence, comply, capture well the, the interface between science and technology, between knowing and applying it, and, and, and willing to do and actually do as well. Fourth driver, um, this one we can blame the architects, is novel building architecture. Um, and is that engineers will always have to keep up with innovation. Uh, we are at the forefront of innovation. Uh, innovation can be by us, or it can be by our clients or by other people, uh, but we are involved in the process of innovating. Uh, in particular for buildings is that architects have these amazing dreams of impossible beautiful buildings that they literally dream exaggerating they dry them they they, they, they can draw them on a napkin uh, they are beautiful they really want them to happen and then they pass it to engineer and say and now you go and make it real and safe please and quickly uh, so they're asking us they're asking you in particular to build taller lighter and faster and more beautiful um, and this is something that brings a lot of dynamism in the field. It makes it actually quite exciting, uh, especially this is important for when it's your daily job, so, you know, to, to have the excitement of, of solving continuously different problems. Uh, it means that new challenges are arriving and new solutions are being created. And this is really good, um, especially if we are going to attract even more of a younger generation. They, they value uh, that our job is dynamic and exciting. Negative things, better related to also the second driver that we saw of change, which was environmental and sustainability, is that new materials and new systems are arriving at an unprecedented rate, really fast. 
this we are being asked to install new materials and new systems even before we have a, a basic understanding of how they behave in fire um, and the standards very often are not enough for us as we can see what is happening i'm in the uk i've been speaking to you from london what has happened with grenfell but it can be applied to hundreds and hundreds of fires around the world uh, is that we discovered too late that the system actually or the material was too flammable so flammable, actually, in reality, it should never have been put next to people because actually it creates um, a safety breach. So there are pressures in new building architecture for uh, installed materials um, in real buildings with real people um, before um, we fully understand what we're doing with it. The last driver is education in fire protection engineering. Uh, this is when academia produces the new generation of engineers, and then when they graduate, they go uh, to industry and then um, they, they become true engineers and they, they have a much faster growth. But academia provides the foundations, uh, provides um, the direction, the, the initial direction and, 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 the, and the, the base upon which industry will uh, build for the true engineer. Um, because of the first driver, performance-based design, there is an even stronger global international need for uh, more engineers which means more degrees and more universities in fire protection engineering. There are many different ways of doing this. It could be an undergraduate degree, it could be a master's degree, it could be a PhD degree, it could be um, a, a, from, I mean, remotely, online, it could be presencial, it could be all style, it could be by reading the literature, it could be by creating the new literature, uh, but it's a very multi multidisciplinary uh, topic that requires um, basic understanding of most of the topics uh, upon which expertise on, on specific topics is, is uh, allowed. Positive things is that this is truly advancing the field for the future. Uh, if we are only teaching the students to continue doing as design as we do today, that will guarantee no future for the field, but actually we are preparing them for the future. That's really good. We are embracing in fire protection engineering the multidisciplinarity of the topic. Uh, there is plenty of space for people with foundations on mechanical engineering or in chemical engineering or in civil engineering or even in material uh, science engineering. And now with the uh, merge with uh, wildfires, fires in the forest, there is also need for ecologists and biologists and, and, and people who, and geographers who truly understand uh, the forest. So very multidisciplinary as we go into the future, even more multidisciplinary. Something negative about education is, unfortunately, we are not always perceived as exciting as we are. Uh, fire protection engineering is a very exciting and very, um, a fastly evolving relevant topic at the forefront of technology but people don't know this um, if we don't tell them if each of us do not become an ambassador so all of us who become ambassador and do outreach and explain to the younger generations and to their parents and to society in general what we do in simple terms uh, and that is something that the, this community doesn't do other communities uh, do this very well um, um, I'm familiar with, for example, how bioengineering is being able to reach so well to the younger generations. They know what bioengineering is. They know it better than their parents, what bioengineering is. They don't know uh, why, uh, what fire protection engineering does, uh, not even their parents. Okay. So now I'm going to change to, uh, I've covered the, system, uh, the, the drivers, so now I'm going to cover uh, the systems. So I'm just reminding you that the systems that I selected these eight systems over here, okay, and I'm going to go take a few of them and go over them uh, uh, some, not, not too slowly uh, this time. So the first system that is changing is buildings, because all the drivers that I showed you before, the performance-based design, sustainability, and overbuilding architecture, the buildings that of today are being designed, are protection engineering-wise, differently than they were before, and the future will mean even more changes. And this affects all layers of prevention, of pre oh, sorry, all layers of protection. Prevention, the way we understand how polymers ignite and how we separate the ignition source from the fuel is different. How we do passive systems for detection, uh, how we do um, a passive system for uh, thermal uh, air protection, how we do suppression, how evacuation is done, how the structural resilience of the building or of the forest is guaranteed. Everything that I say is about the building, but actually there are very strong analogies to how protect the forest or the wild urban interface 
um, of, of um, a building inside the, the forest is, is designed for that. A specific example is what was considered by the experts as the second most important system being changed, which is timber buildings. And we're not talking about um, the short uh, or not high buildings that we've been doing for uh, millions of years. We're actually talking about a new type of building, which is tall timber. And it's not that it looks like it's made of wood or it's not like superficially is wood. It's actually that the structure is made of wood, which is something that architects are embracing all around the world. Architects want these buildings to be made out of timber, structurally speaking. And they want them for very good reasons. They say it's more sustainable. The footprint is reduced by orders of magnitude. They say it's faster to build. They say it's easier to build. And they say it's more beautiful and more um, iconic to do. Um, and these buildings, although architects want to design them, actually are not being built and, and, and actually facing a barrier to market because of its perceived lower fire safety. Now, I happen to have a specific view as an expert in, in fire protection engineering that is perfectly possible to design a tall timber building um, that is safe. Uh, now, what I don't know is how, and whoever figures out how, then this person will have a beautiful business. But this person that knows how to do it has to convince the authorities that actually it can be designed uh, tall timber in perfectly safe conditions, as safe as it were to be made of concrete or steel or brick. Um, and the conversation that uh, tall timber this, uh, creates here in London, there is a lot of references to the Great Fire of London of 1666, where it says, timber, um, no, it fueled the Great Fire of London. Uh, whereas the architect would have a conversation like, I love timber, is the building of the 21st century. And these completely diametral approaches to timber, um, we have to talk to each other and reach an agreement for tall timber through science and through uh, an understanding of how truly wood burns and how truly a wood chars and wood actually or timber loses its structural strength in the case of fire and how it contributes or not into a fire that is happening in a timber are concerned. So big, big role for, for all of us to, to resolve how to do tall timbers um, in a safe manner. Third system is uh, something that doesn't need presentation now, although I'm referring to Grenfell. Um, here in London, I'm literally uh, about a mile or two miles from Grenfell. I almost can see it from my window. Um, it's building facades. Um, is for the last 40 years or maybe 50 years polymers have also made it into our facades for very good reasons because polymers can actually are light and make facades light it means which actually you can build faster with more flexibility they are insulating thermal insulating which means that actually complies with all the drivers of sustainability and lower um, energy requirements of the building he just have and it's cheaper he has one problem one single problem that actually polymers in the facade are bringing flammability into the facade. Um, and this creates an issue. This creates uh, facade fires, which have a tendency when they happen to be very large. In fact, they are so large that we don't learn about them through specialized publications. We don't need an expert to tell us about this. We learn about this through social media because the, photo the photos and the media covering it are frightened by what they see. Um, there are many fires. We did a survey recently. There is about five fires, very large fires, that we learn about through social media worldwide. This is about seven times more than it used to be 30 years ago. Uh, so the trend is more fires uh, because actually there are more buildings with facades which with, with are flammable. Now, it's not a surprise to anyone that if you have a facade that has an amount of polymer inside, that your facade is flammable to some degree. That's not a surprise to anyone. The, the surprise to a lot of people um, is that it was that it can be so flammable or unacceptably flammable. And our state of the art of knowledge of how a facade becomes flammable is so poor, it's actually so desperate that the only way that we have to know if it's acceptably flammable or not is to actually burn the true facade with the incredible cost and time consumption and, and the amount of tests that are required to do this. So obviously uh, engineers are asking for something better in terms of knowledge and our scientists are, are on the task of providing something better that they can use for better design.
Um, system number four in that is changing is lithium ion batteries. Uh, lithium ion batteries have revolutionized technology, consumer electronics, uh, our laptops, our phones, our toys, our drones, our cars, our houses. They are absolutely everywhere. It's a fantastic technology that really has got um, the whole world um, uh, going. It has an issue. Um, I call it the elephant in the room of energy innovation, is that batteries are not only flammable. We are, we are familiar with flammable elements. Our chairs, our upholstery, our houses have a lot of flammability, and our uh, wooden uh, furniture. The, 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 what is new with lithium-ion batteries is that the fuel is in intimate contact with the ignition source. The two of them are resting actually millimeters or actually even less than millimeters, a fraction of a millimeter together. And that actually leads to what is called uh, self-ignition fires or, or actually or mechanical failures or, me or electrical failures that lead to a fire because the ignition source is so close to the fuel itself. If it were to be just the ignition source, then you just put the phone somewhere else. But actually, you can't because the phone itself is resting on on the on the field. Um, Boeing learned this uh, the hard way with the issues with the batteries in the 707. Tesla is learning this, and they spent a significant amount of money into avoiding these fires. Smartphones like Samsung almost bankrupt because of uh, not paying enough attention to uh, self-heating. Laptops, IBM, Lenovo all had problems with this. Hoverboards have been forbidden. Uh, typically, it happens during the Christmas. Um, when, when suddenly battery, battery fires start to be produced in new products, or uh, now with the movement of moving large batteries into buildings with what we are called energy storage systems. <clears throat> the fifth system uh, that was seen in the survey um, was tunnels. Uh, this was exciting, and it got a lot of people by surprise that this was such an important system being changed. But tunnels are, um, especially in high density cities or in, uh, in places of the world that are um, with a lot of waterways or a lot of mountains, then tunnels, tunnels is a, a very uh, successful technology. And tunnels have a very specific fire problem. Actually, fire problems in tunnels are accentuated by the fact that they have a mainly one direction of evacuation, which is the same direction across which the, the smoke wants to spread. Um, so evacuation and ventilation in tunnels is a big thing uh, where a lot of is at stake um, in it. And it's a system that is expected to, to change significantly how it is being designed. Um, uh, system number six is a smart firefighting. Uh, this is exciting. This is the future of how um, engineers are going to be doing their fire protection. It embraces big data. It embraces artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, it embraces all of them at the same time. It's, it's literally making uh, a buildings smart in the sense that the building itself knows what is happening and it can use this knowledge and, uh, um, and fancy algorithms to, to help the engineers and the firefighters to know what is actually might be happening in the future. It's, it's a way of forecasting the future in the building as it is ongoing or helping the firefighters um, uh, plan their, uh, their, their, um, their the interpret their intervention into the building. Uh, very quickly, I will go through uh, some other systems that are lower than the top six. One of them is flame retardancy. I've highlighted this already. Flame uh, flammability um, is related to the first layer of protection, prevention. So the first layer of prevention is do not put a fuel that is too flammable close to an ignition source that is too large. And what do we mean by too flammable or ignition source that is too large? And that is something that can be studied and quantified. And actually, different countries around the world have set standards. And they say, if your material doesn't pass this standard, I consider it to be too flammable for the ignition sources that I'm considering. And this is important because uh, by uh, we are being forced as engineers to balance flammability with toxicity, toxicity of uh, the fuel um, uh, because of the chemistry it has, um, example, flame retardants, or actually once it's burning, the smoke that it produces. And, and that's a false dichotomy. Uh, in my point of view, we cannot, we should not be balancing one or the other. We should do excellent in both of them independently. So we should not have fuels uh, that are flammable, and we should not have fuels that are toxic. And the two of them uh, should be maximized independently. It's 
unfortunate that we're being asked, as is happening in California, and there are different moves here in the UK and in Europe, um, that because of a perceived um, um, vision on toxicology, that actually um, the flammability standards are being decreased and more flammable materials are being brought into our environments. Another one is composites. You might be familiar if you are engineers, mechanical engineers in particular, with composites, are very strong, very light, very durable uh, materials that have revolutionized manufacturing, manufacturing of airplanes, for example, or of cars, or many engineering systems and even trains. The problem with all these polymers is that they have a degree of flammability. Um, and actually that by addressing the flammability, we immediately typically decrease their strength or their weight, and then we make composites less flammable, but less attractive from an engineering point of view. And that is because historically, uh, the engineers who develop the composites, they don't look into the um, flammability, they just develop the whole problem, their whole uh, system. And then at the end, literally the day before launching to market, they take a look at the flammability. And that then they get surprised because obviously they've not been looking into that variable and they, yes, there is a lot of lost opportunities into understanding the flammability of a composite from the beginning at the same time as they're developing an understanding of their strength and their flexibility and their toughness and how to manufacture it. So there are no surprises uh, later on. So with this, I'm finishing. Uh, just to remind you that fire protection engineers are making the world safer on a daily basis, tackling um, fire to protect people, their property and the environment. Um, that in the survey, we have found uh, a series of challenges for change and fire protection engineering wants to convert those challenges into opportunities. The top opportunities are performance design and environmental protection and the interface between science and technology and novel building architecture and education in fire protection engineering. Uh, this all together is making fire protection engineering systems and the field rapidly evolving, uh, which uh, highlights the fact that fire is a very old problem. It's older than humanity. When humans um, develop as a species, actually fire already existed, but fire keeps morphing into different hazards. And as we humans create technology or modify our environment, we are modifying the fire. Um, that we saw that the drivers for change are very diverse. And this is because fire safety engineering is very multidisciplinary. So it's highlighting the fact that it's not just about uh, buildings or forests or polymers for one type of protection, it's all about different environments and all these multiple layers of protection that we have. So I foresee that the future means that engineers should continue, fire protection engineers should continue at the forefront of technology and innovation, uh, and I foresee very exciting years. And with this, I finish. Thank you very much. These are the names of some of the people who agreed to be named. Uh, some of them, more people uh, uh, participated in the survey, but this, uh, they agreed to be named um, in my slide. So I thank them because without their opinions, I will not be able to have uh, an overall opinion on what's changing in the field. Thank you very much.